Well, thank you, everyone, and uh, welcome to the Alzheimer Caregiver and Education and Support series of lectures that we do. It's called our ACES Talks, where we have monthly talks on some topic relevant to Alzheimer's disease and other forms of dementia. So today, I'm really happy and proud to introduce uh, Judy Prescott. And uh, Judy, I, I think of you as she's an actress, she is a mother, she is of course a woman, and a poet, and someone who has been a caretaker of her own mother who had Alzheimer's disease. And Judy compiled a series of incredible poems that she wrote, and I'm not going to give more away, while her mother was suffering from Alzheimer's disease. And she has a book of this poetry called Searching for Cece. And so today I'd like to introduce Judy and, and talk about her work and she's gonna do some, some readings from her, um, her book. So to open up, I just wanna say how we came to meet mm -hmm. was that we have a, a couple of support groups here at um, UCLA called the Beyond Alzheimer's Support Groups that meet weekly. And one day I received this package in, in the mail that had this book in it and a really beautiful letter from Judy about, about her and her experience. And so we talked and um, that set the stage for Judy coming here today and uh, doing many things, but one is to present, um, present writings from her her poetry book so welcome thank Thanks. you dr linda i'm so um thrilled by the work that you do and i saw the article about um dr linda and her work with patty davis here at the hospital and i think it's such a valuable resource mm -hmm. to have this type of thing available and i wish i had found it a little earlier um I wrote this book, Searching for Cece, over an eight-year period um, at a time when my mom had dementia and early onset Alzheimer's. She got the disease when she was um, 63 years old, I would say. So this was sort of my support group in a way. I, I tried to go the, or the way of, um, I contacted the Alzheimer's Association and I, I would always call and say, okay, yeah, um, I want to find a meeting. And I'd, they'd tell me where the meeting was, and I would get on a plane and go visit my mother in Maine. You know, I never would go to the meeting. It was just, I'm a long-distance caregiver, so, or I was. My mother passed away four months ago. So I would always travel to her instead of um, sort of staying put and taking care of myself in a way. It was very hard not to have her with me. Um, so... This book, poetry for me, has always been a way to sort of cope with a, try, a, a situation which I want to understand. I want to understand better what my mother was going through and what I was going through. And this was my way of following her journey. So they were written over an eight-year period, and they sort of just sort of track the progression of her illness. And, um, yeah, and do you want to... Yeah, I, I, I think it's amazing that <clears throat> this is a compilation, when you think about it, in real time. So this is not a retrospective. And when I, when I read the poetry, I read it from the perspective of somebody who runs a, a caregiver support group as a psychologist and as a person, you know, just thinking about what it would be like to be a caregiver for someone that I loved. And what really struck me is I saw a change in your poems over time. That there seemed to be, the poems changed as what I was imagining was your mother was progressing through her illness. And right. it seemed to me that the, the poems also changed from being more hopeful in the beginning to kind of being in a holding pattern to then being um, I think resigned to the fact that this is a terminal disease and people don't get better to where your mother was approaching the end. Right. But I'm wondering 
you know, is that accurate? Was I picking something up, or can you tell me what what was going on with you? Oh, I know it's eight years, but yeah, you wrote that's these poems. very accurate. They um, in the beginning, I I think they're in different chapters that show sort of this journey and where I was, and maybe I could read for you an example of sort of an early poem that shows my, uh, the early side of things where I was just trying to make sense of it all. This poem is called Proof. And by the way, the book has beautiful artwork because I have this crazy talented family of artists in Maine and they all paint and they have since I was very little. And I, my brother John and I would just say, oh, we better not try to draw anything because look at what they're doing. It was just amazing. But the whole book is just amazing works of art and that really was a joy to me to ask them to give me their artwork and then to send it. Um, proof. She disappears before me silently slipping into a realm in which I don't figure, quietly busying herself with new vistas devoid of reason. If she cannot know me, do I exist? My history is erased systematically as each neuron misfires and no longer seeks its intended connection. As the night rain displaces the dust of daily life, so am I displaced, destined to build my own boat and sail to higher ground. So that's an example of one that I wrote in the very beginning, so sort I'm, of getting ready for a journey, perhaps. Oh yeah, I was going to ask you, I know this is looking <clears throat> way back, but that was what you were feeling at the time, you think, or? Right, and just trying to understand what exactly it was, how I was going to. Yeah, it's a very, un, as you probably know, many of you are caregivers, that um, it's a very daunting thing all of a sudden not to be recognized by a parent or a loved one. And it's very, in the beginning you think, oh my gosh, they don't, they don't know me, they don't, but they do, they always know us. It's just we have to enter their world and understand their language and understand their body movements to know that absolutely you're somebody that they love. It's just a different, different sort of world to step into. How did you do that? Because that's one of the difficulties of being a caregiver is to find the way to communicate and enter somebody's world. That's, that's the challenge or one of the challenges. How, how did you do that? I think it's different for everyone, but what was, your, what was your key to open the door to her world? Well, I was so fortunate um, because this, a woman, a lovely woman, Marcia Shalik was her name, and she ran the dementia unit in my mom's facility. Mm -hmm. And when we had to move her from the other part of the facility into this dementia unit, she handed me this book, and it's called Learning to Speak Alzheimer's by Joanne Conan Costa. And she talked about this habilitation method of handling Alzheimer's patients where in the old days it was. For instance, if your mother would say, I want my mother, I want my mother. And they would say, your mother is dead. And they would have to restrain you or medicate you. And it, that's how they handled patients. And then this woman taught me that you say, oh, let's talk about your mom. End of story. Let's recircuit. Let's go someplace else. Let's find the joy in the moment. What do you have to give to me? Let's talk about something happy. Let's smile and try to... So it was such a gift to me to learn that because in the beginning, when I moved her into the first part of assisted living, mm -hmm. um, she was throwing boxes at me and, you know, everything else. And I, I was getting upset. And in the beginning, I would say, hey, Mom, you can't treat me like that. And that, whoo, that escalated. So I learned... <laughs> Let's not do that. That was, let's, that's uh, 101. Let's not go there. So that taught me slowly to sort of understand that this was an illness mm -hmm. and it wasn't about me and that I had to take it away from myself and honor my mother and look at that beautiful person who's still here right. and still has a life and a value and uh, figure out how to accommodate that in a way. How did you come to writing the poems? I mean, you know, most people, that's not a common way of... <laughs> it's not of, a go-to place. Right, for well, right, exactly. How, yeah. how did you come about doing that? Well, you know, when I was a child, I, um, I started writing when I was pretty young. My best friend died of a heart failure when I was very young. Mm -hmm. So I, I was from a culture where 
you didn't sort of talk about it, you would just not mention it again and that was going to go away. So I realized, oh wow, okay, that's hard. So I started writing and that's when I first started writing. I must have been um, 12 or so when I started writing. So when this was happening, I hadn't written in a while, I had, uh, but that was how I figured it out. Mm -hmm. That was how I processed it. And that was, I wanted to find the beauty in it. Mm -hmm. I knew there was beauty in the journey. I, I knew that I wanted to bear witness to what was happening to my mother in a, in a big way. To, she's a spectacular lady and she was beautiful and she was so smart. She could do the New York Times crossword puzzle in an hour, you know, Sunday. And so I just was so in awe of uh, her ability and her, uh, her amazing person. So I wanted to honor it. And I also wanted to understand how it was affecting me so that I could welcome, hello. I wanted to understand how uh, that was gonna change my life, right. how I could better. And I was across the country and I'd fly back home and feel completely lost without her. So that made me feel close to her, connected with her in a way. I felt like I was still communicating with her by writing these. Right. Okay. I was communicating with her. When, <clears throat> I think though you, when you talk about being a long distance caregiver, yeah. you, you were in the sense that you lived in, on the West Coast yeah. and your mother was in Maine. Maine. So that's about as long distance as you can get. Unless you're in Hawaii or something, yeah. right? But Hello, come in. Welcome. Hello. Hi, nice to see you. But, but I also think that there were some pretty intense moments in your caregiving. Oh, because yeah. Because when you visited your mom, do you mind me no. asking about this? Yeah. Where did you stay when you visited your mom? In the dementia ward. <laughs> I stayed in her, in her room her little room in her, she had a little full-size bed and I stayed there with her. And I would take care of her and help the nurses. And I, it was funny, it was fabulous. I'd eat at a little table with all the people, the patients, they were all my friends. Um, I told you about a, a wonderful woman, Goldie, who ne lived next door to my mother who was always wreaking havoc. And uh -huh. coming up to my mother's room, she'd knock on the door and say, Cece, there's a man coming, so don't open the door, whatever you do. And then she'd go in her room, and my mother would be cowering on her bed, going, oh, my God. And then Goldie would come back two minutes later and slam that door, you know, ah, and my mother would scream. And, you know, this was, it was a really fascinating world that I was living in. But I loved the people. I learned how to sort of understand how to not wear bright red and set people off, not. I learned how to not say, how are you? How are you doing today? That's not a question we want to ask an Alzheimer's patient necessarily. We want to just, you know, talk about something happy. So, I think that's that's incredible because you're a caregiver, long distance. But when you were there, you were really right. in the thick right. of it, uh, yeah. in the dementia ward or unit, living with your mom. So it was kind of like all, all, you know, all in or. 2,000 miles away, but never all out mentally. Right. Just distance wise, but never all out mentally. And that's exactly, I think, why I needed to write the poetry because I felt always, I think many of you could probably relate to that, um, you feel like you're leaving a small child often, unattended. It's certainly before I had her in a facility when she was at her home. It's a dangerous situation or you just, uh, yeah, I felt very responsible for her. Um, but I see my friend Scott here, and I just remembered that you, Scott, re reacted to a certain poem, um, Silent Sea, that you really liked. And I would like to read that poem because it kind of shows exactly what Dr. Linda is talking about. This, um, how can I say, sort of a, you're watching and you're seeing something very unfortunate happen, but you have no control to stop it. So. You just want to bear witness, hello? Um, it's called Silent Sea. Bright eyes, deepest blue, dimmed milk white, searching, struggling, floating backwards to warmer waters in desperate hope of light. Black ice, fierce, intruding, restructures sense. Bluest eyes, brilliant blue, empty. Tidal ebb, the sea is silent. So I would, I would, say that that's an example of 
the beginning stage where I didn't, I thought she was going and going quickly and gone. Right. Although she was still with me. But it was just that feeling of, of loss and, and me wrestling with, how am I going to do this, right? I think it's very hard to look into the empty eyes. Too. Yeah. Um, because I, I see that in my work with patients, that eyes changed. And, um, it, you know, eyes, they say, is the mirror to the soul. Right. So how did you continue to see your mom's soul in spite hmm. of the empty eyes? I think I learned, you know, she was a feisty Irish woman with a wonderful temper, and uh, she had a great sense of humor, and she would, um, I'd see it in her flashes with her caretakers or, you know, making a joke in some way even when she couldn't speak. But I have to tell you, she passed away, as I said, four months ago. And when I was with her before she passed away, her eyes were so intense. She was looking at me with a clarity that I don't think I ever saw in, in my life from her. And she was trying to talk to me and trying to tell me um, something. And I said, I know, Mom, I see that. I see what you're, I see that you love me. I'm here. And what I learned is that they are always here. They might not have the facility or the language to behave in a, a manner that we would like them to or that we understand, or that's acceptable, mm -hmm. but there is always, well, I may, perhaps I was fortunate, perhaps I was fortunate, but my mother kept one foot in for me somehow. Yeah. She um, probably knew that I didn't, wasn't ready to have her leave me entirely, so. It's, it's funny that you mention that because, um, as you know, I work with Patty Davis and right. facilitating the group and she mentioned something very similar before her father passed away, was that uh, he had a definite awakening look in his mm. eyes. And it was the same thing. He looked at her in a very knowing kind of way and he had not had that right. look for a few years. Right. And it was almost as though, well, it's not almost. I mean, he was communicating with her and she understood that communication just like you understood that communication. It's amazing because when I first realized something was amiss with my mother and I wanted to take her to the doctor, I flew back to Maine. And um, I took her to see the physician and Dr. Kirsch looked at her and said, okay, Cece, what's going on here? And she said, well, you know, sometimes it's just a little bit easier to go somewhere else in your head. You know what I mean? And I thought, oh, mom. Jeez, come on, don't do that, you know. But it, it was easier for her. This illness, somehow she found a place that was very peaceful for her. And I had to honor that and accept that and step, as I said, step into her world and, and understand that that is where she needed to be. And the amount of energy it took for her to pull herself out of that and be with me was painful and difficult for her. How and I, for you? For me, it was... Well, there's a poem in here. It's not a favorite, but I can tell you the exact moment um, where I saw her the last time. And she showed up in that moment, and I thought, oh, my gosh, there she is. And I saw the woman with a lot of worry. And um, I'm going to read that for you because um, if I can find it, here it is. It's called, once again, this is a phenomenal. I told you the book has my family's art in it, and they're all so talented. And it was so wonderful to have them uh, give me this to help me with this journey. Um, this is called Mother's Lullaby. For a moment I saw you, now specter, once stalwart, sober-voiced, sharp with wisdom, focused clean near the ache. You showed yourself briefly over stake spiked with history. I sensed you recircuit those raw, well-worn days. Dire sorrow plays harshly on one fine of tuning. I watched you change stations, ride wild toward the dawn. Bone white light sheds comfort, hide, lifts shadow, hides memory, shines blithely down pathways impervious to pain. And my feeling was that she was in a place that was less painful for her in that way. When, when did you write that particular poem? Very early on. That was one of the first poems I wrote um, when she, when she started to disappear in that way, 
that's when I needed to write. Which makes me think about something, the title of the book. Yes. Searching for Cece. Can right. you talk a little bit about, about what that means to you? Yeah, I think I'm still doing it. I think I'm searching and uh, for my mom. And as I said, I want to give my mother a voice. I wanted to bear witness. I wanted to show what she's, she'd been through and the phenomenal person that she was and what she did for my brothers and I and uh, for many people. So searching for Cece, this was my, ability, my attempt to find the, the core of Cece, regardless of what state she was in. I suppose, to find the essence, like I do in my acting work, work to always try to find the essence of a character, right, Scott? We try to find the, um, what makes a character really think or, or, or breathe. So um, I wanted to understand my mother. Did you understand her when she was not demented? I did. I was fortunate. I had a, my mom, I had an interaction with her where I said, Mom, you know, I, I'm tired of all this. You've been a really difficult mother. And she said, I know, and I'm sorry. <laughs> and I said, really? <laughs> and so for 10 years, my mother and I were great friends. And um, she explained a lot that went on. And I was so uh, fortunate to have that amazing relationship with this woman. So then when she left, it was kind of sad for me mm -hmm. to have gained that and then. So you were looking for her again? Is that? I what? still look, for, still well, look for I still look for her. Of course. I think she's a bird now. I'm convinced that she's a black crow. <laughs> that I see everywhere a black hawk um, that showed up after she passed away. Um, you know, I do want to read you something. Please. This is something that I wrote after she passed away. So this is not in the book. But um, it's a thought about, you know, where she went and how that went. Okay. Without a word, without a word, with a silent plea, a crystal blue yearning, tongue flipping, you taught me. Without a word, you stayed, one foot in my realm, steady, preparing me. You knew I needed a line, a buoy. You luffed while waiting. I heard it, this stillness we bandied, loudly beating, banging. You held, wings flexed, for the sound of my soul solid. A sudden shiver to flight without a word, you left me full. So I do have a feeling that she left me when she felt that I was ready to be left. And um, perhaps spent, yeah, it was a tough 12 years for her, I'm sure. For you too? Yeah, for me too. It almost sounds like there's a thank you in that poem. Yeah. You know, I don't think I would have learned the compassion the patience, um, my ability to really listen in a different way than we humans listen, um, to look and watch uh, different things in different situations. And I feel very fortunate that my daughter, who Dr. Bates delivered right here, Elizabeth, has um, grown up in the facility and is seeing people who are not quote unquote perfect or uh, what we deem as acceptable often in society. Mm -hmm. um, and made a home there for herself. So she was, it's a gift. I think it's a gift to learn that early. I'm looking at my friend David and Laura Jean here, whose son, or whose son, brother, had um, AIDS-related dementia, and he was my best friend. And I took care of him for many years, and he, had, he was the same way. He's there. We just have to understand how to access. I think a lot of people feel abandoned sometimes by the person that has the disease because they can't, at least in the usual way, can't give them the same right. attention, For sure. communication. Yeah. Did that ever happen to you? Did you ever yeah. feel that way? You know, perhaps, uh, yeah. I was like, where's my mom? Boy, I'm unlucky. <laughs> um, but in a way, I grew up... Uh, you know, it's funny, I grew up in a very, you have to pull yourself up by your own bootstraps, this sort of Puritan way of being, and um, I was very conditioned in that, and I was a bit of a loner, um, hence the poetry mm -hmm. um, and the acting, <laughs> no doubt. So, you know, maybe it's something that uh, 
I might have been okay at entering that and and um, accepting it. It was sad, yeah. but it gave me great pleasure to see her happy and to see her find the joy in something, you know. And what kinds of things did, did she find joyous or make her happy? Because that's another issue that's very hard for caregivers is the right. thinking that my loved one is suffering, they're not happy, they're miserable, and sometimes people are, and sometimes we're not sure what they're thinking. Right. So how did you know um, that things were making her happy? Well, she would just be more, uh, if she wasn't afraid, mm -hmm. if she wasn't afraid. It, Alzheimer's makes people very frightened. And if she felt safe and at peace, I knew she was okay. If we put Jean Kelly in and she could watch um, An American in Paris and imitate the dance when he kicks his foot out with mm -hmm. all those kids, um, <laughs> she would do it over and over. She couldn't, you know, she just, that gave her huge joy, entertainment that way. And uh, painting, mm -hmm. it's unbelievable. Uh, they're, they're, the last painting in this book um, was done by my mother. I didn't know she could paint. Um, she's not from the side of family where all the crazy artists came from. That's my father's side. But this painting she did when she was in assisted living. And the only reason I knew that she did it is because the woman who ran the desk, Trudy, at the facility said one day, Judy, your mom may gave me something and I want you to have it. And I said, wow, that's really nice. And, and it, it's nice for me because it says Cece. Right. And I think for all of you, it's pretty amazing to see your mother or your loved one's signature. It's them. Right, it's uh, and she wasn't able to write after that. So what a beautiful thing! This is amazing too. Yeah, and it's amazing. She, she, she painted. She was in the early stages of yeah. dementia when she did that. Yeah. So really beautiful. it shows that when you think about it, you know, something like that coming from someone who has dementia. There's a beauty inside there that definitely right. she is feeling. It's feeling really peaceful, yeah. yeah. And I can't say enough about the extraordinary people who take care of our parents or our loved ones. They're just unbelievable. They would text me and take little pictures and send them to me. And, and my mother loved them. They said even when she was dying, as she died, she kind of looked at one and went, ha, 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 like that. <laughs> and I'm like, what's better than that? And they called me in the middle of the night, <laughs> 3 in the morning. And I'm talking. They said, your mother's, I heard she's turning blue. She's turning blue. It's not very pleasant. And yet I was speaking with her. So, and she kind of laughed and she passed away, but they loved her. And I, it, the testament to that is, you know, 20 people at th 3 a.m. all in her room. So what a beautiful thing. Yeah. So Most I, of us worry about dying alone and yeah, she right? had, she was lucky. She was holding court that day, yeah. it sounds like. I think she always was. And I think I feel so lucky because she was a bigger than life presence, and I don't think I ever realized that. But when my mother walked into a room, she, well, she kind of pretended to be terribly shy, but she was five, nine and a half. She was stunningly beautiful. She had black hair, blue eyes, and she'd be like, oh, excuse me, and everyone would look. There's, who is that woman? And I think I felt that presence in my life, this big woman uh, who, although she was somewhat shy, had quite a presence. Yeah. You know, I think maybe I should read you something about her. Please. I did read, um, let's see, um, Measuring Up. That's an early one, but it's about mom and me. I'm reading you all the sad ones. I should read you something cheerier. Um, measuring Up. A silhouette not as tall, not as stately, of slighter frame. A temperament not as sharp, not as Irish, of subtler nature. A wit not as quick, not as wicked, of hesitant word. A pride not as glowing nor righteous of humbler grain, a loss no less poignant nor devastating of gargantuan proportion. It kind of gives you the idea of my view of her and me trying to measure up to this person. That there, I, there was a poem there that really moved me. Do you mind if, no. if I ask you about that? Yeah. Um, this was one. On, it's on page 46. Okay. Oh, yeah. So, <laughs> would you read it and then sure. I'll ask you a question? About it? Sure. Um, it's called Let's Just Get Home. And this painting is really pretty. It's by my brother Tom, who's such a talented painter. That's a whole other story about how the families kind of fall apart and then come back together. Tommy and I. That's good. Let's just get home, she said. 
I could take you by the hand, we could hop a moving train. I could ride you on my handlebars far from this dreary lane. I could flag a passing cab, tell the driver, hurry, quick. I could start up an old outboard, give the engine one swift kick. If I'd wings, I'd surely fly you. I have a map, I'd find the way. I'd careen you back in time with me to somewhere sense still lay. Just hold my waist, don't let me go. The fog will lift, you'll see once more. I'll not quit you, it's getting cold. I'll lead you straight to your front door. What was going on when you wrote that poem? <laughs> I mean, it, I, it was one of my favorites. That was, a tra I think, a real transition that's, for that's me. What I was wondering. Yeah. Um, as you can see, it's written sort of from a child's perspective. Mm -hmm. And uh, the child, me being the daughter, uh, just how can I help you, Mom? Don't worry. I can help you. I can get you there. I'll take you there. I'm not going to leave you here. And it was sort of me understanding. So was she talking to you in that poem, or were you talking to her? Oh, it was me talking to her. Yeah. 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 And she, yeah, you know, Mom would say sometimes, you know, Judy, sometimes I just want to walk into traffic. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, let's not think about that. Let's go do something else. <laughs> let's not. But it, it's, the tragic part of this illness is they know, yeah. the time when they know something's amiss, and it's horrible to watch. To witness painful um, and it's a joyous thing when they find that they're safe mm -hmm. and that there's a life for them and that they have peers and they're accepted by these you know Roger these wonderful people I've met who walk around and became my friends also it's almost like you could retitle this the secret life of patients with Alzheimer's disease because a lot of the times we don't appreciate or we don't think of someone as having friends you know, once they have dementia, they have like the horrible D word, dementia. Right. And it, it in many ways masks the essence, you're talking about the essence of right. the person. Right. It masks the humanity in some ways because we just can't get past that word. But what I find is amazing about y what you figured out along the way is you saw her humanity, you saw her social network, her, her culture, her friends, and you did see something inside of her that, you know, people that don't have dementia have a very difficult time seeing in, in someone because it's so hard to understand them. For but sure, the, yeah. You know, the fact that you lived part-time with her was, to me, you got to do something really special, hard, I'm sure, but special in that you got to see her living her life as a demented patient, an individual with dementia. Right, and I think I needed to see that. And I also, the illness is a difficult one because um, there's a stigma attached and everybody wants to hide that, oh yes, my mother and I are having lunch and she's making something out of the sugar packets and they're flying across the room. And we can take that as an embarrassment or as, that's my mom, that's just who she is and let's not try to correct it or change it. I like that giraffe, that's a nice giraffe, whatever she's making, or um, it took me a long time because the way I grew up, one time, which is just unbelievable because Aunt, ne aunt Nina died two weeks after my mother, but mm -hmm. my aunt in Maine, one time I took my mom, she said, I want to go to, back to Christmas Cove, I want to go to Christmas Cove, where we grew up when we were little kids, and so we went to this old farmhouse where we had lived, and I said, okay, this is the farm, Mom. And she got out of the car, and there was a man standing there, and they were selling it. So he, his mom just walked in and said, hello, and walked right into the house and started looking around. And this man sort of joined us and walked with us. And she, I said, this is a kitchen, right, Mom? And she, yeah, and we just walked in. And at the end, you know, it was extraordinary. She just needed to see what she wanted to see. When we went back out to the car, I said, I'm sorry, my mother has Alzheimer's disease. disease. And he said, I know. You know, what a beautiful thing. I know, you know, it's okay, it's okay. And uh, to get rid of the stigma and to sort of hang up that whole idea that it's a, it's a mental illness, which is a terrifying thing in our society. So, I mean, my family members often, some of them wouldn't go into the unit because it's too scary. Is it mm -hmm. contagious, is it? Mm -hmm. You know, so um, there was a lot of beauty to be found and a lot of fun. And she was still a piece of work and still hilarious. So I feel very fortunate. 
you know. That last story that you told reminds me a little bit of the movie The Trip to Bountiful. Oh, I love that film, where, yes. Where uh, at the end of the movie, this, this woman had been trying to get back home, right? right to right. this old farmhouse, and everybody point. was kind of poo-pooing her uh, throughout the movie, and she does go back there, and she does connect with the place. And, yeah. and I think there's a similar yeah. parallel there in the sense that yeah. it, it's being drawn to something really beautiful that was important and beautiful to her, but the fact is you were you were an understanding daughter in real life, where in the movie she didn't have very understanding children. Right. But I think that's right. a great gift that you, you know, that you gave to her. Well, thank you. And I think what I've learned and what I wrote a poem uh, is, is to let go, okay. to let go and to not control, right? right? I think we try so desperately to brace and to control in this life, because it's terrifying at every, you know, it's life, um, and we want to control, and, and I learned to let go early on, or I tried to tell myself I did when I wrote this poem. I don't think I was there yet, but I, was, I knew that I needed to, and this poem is called Bon Voyage. Sometimes it's better to loosen the spring line and let her float away. If the storm is that great, why keep her tethered, battering herself to pieces at the dock? Let her go. Watch her float peacefully away under a gray and turbulent sky, a last grand sail into whatever lies beyond, a graceful exit from all things measured and charted. Beautiful catch, I release you. So when I wrote that poem, I don't think I was ready to release her, but I knew that I needed to, so it helped me. How, how do you do that, though? How do you release somebody? Um, that's a very interesting question. <laughs> Uh, or how did you how did you release her? Put it that way. Do you know what? In a way, I say to myself, "Let go, let God." Just something I heard. Just let it go. Just we don't know. We don't have any answers. And uh, just let live and let live is a wonderful expression. It's true. Mm -hmm. You know, we have. It's not up to us to judge another person's living, or another person's situation. It might be just fine, mm -hmm. as long as they're safe. So. I've, I've seen that in, in the caregivers, and sometimes when I speak to somebody's doctor and I talk to, let's say, an adult child, there is a difference. Sometimes the doctor is, has some wisdom about, you know, this is the person's place right now. This is their experience. We want people to be comfortable. They're happy. If they have a stain on their blouse, what's the, what's the problem? Right. If, if they choose to wear polka dots with plaid, you know, in a, you know there could look. be far worse things than that. Right. What we don't want to see is somebody doing something self-destructive, yeah. or we yeah. don't want to see them, like you say, fearful or right. crying. Right. But to let go of some of the conventions of, uh, that we think are so important, like does my you know, top match my socks? Yeah, kind of thing. for sure. And yeah. I, I think I was okay with that, but I wasn't okay. I tried to control um, the, in the family. My brother and I would butt heads. You know, my brother had his ideas of my mom and I had my ideas. Mm -hmm. And that became my brother. And my way of handling the grief mm -hmm. was, you know, you have to recognize it and accept it and say, you know what, that doesn't matter. Right. As long as mom is okay, that doesn't matter. And uh, he's having a hard time too, and I'm having a hard time. And writing this book, and me calling him, saying, "Hey, Tommy, you're a, an amazing uh, artist and one of my favorite artists. How about giving me some of your artwork for my book?" And you know, I had Aunt Petey and uh -huh. and and my cousin Ann and my aunt Sue in here, and and I was like, you know, I need it soon. <laughs> Tommy tortured me to the last minute. I had the whole thing assembled, and then he sent me, like, all right, here are four pieces of art. So I was like, oh, out with that, in with that. Okay, let's get this thing published. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's going to hurt a family. That's what it hurts, our, the family. The patient can be okay, but right. it, it hurts a family. And I think that makes it extra painful to have to be a caregiver or a loved one of someone with Alzheimer's disease, it's often the family strife yeah. that's worse than the patient's current state. Sure. And sometimes things can be quite okay 
I mean, granted the situation, but can be quite okay with the patient if people didn't try to control every little thing or get at odds with each other. Right. But it's, you're right, I think it, it is a, it becomes a, a stage, pardon the, a stage the analogy, for it, yes. To act out a lot of people's own anxieties about the situation or to rehash some of their own problems that they've had with each other over the years. Right. And it's really important to be able to see that, but it it's, can be quite difficult yeah. to realize that in the moment. Oh, yeah. And I was very fortunate that I didn't have any unfinished business with my mother. Yeah. That's a really That's lucky, biggie. a big thing. Yeah. So I was fortunate in that way. Yeah. And I have to understand that maybe if somebody else in the family did, that would really right. be hard. So. Um, just one question, because you we're at the place where you talked about compiling the art, et cetera. This is a book you can't plan for. This is not right. something that you said 15 years ago. No. <laughs> I want to write a book of poems, you know, while my mother has Alzheimer's disease. How did you go about compiling and, you know, deciding about, here is a book of my poems? Well, you know what's funny is mom used to edit my poetry. So I, I've written for a long time and she would edit it. I would send it and she, would, she was terrific. And uh, she liked my poetry, and I thought, wow, ooh, that's funny. Yeah, because, you know, you're a poet and you write, and nobody sees your work. Mm -hmm. So this was, um, I would, was writing about mom, and I, I didn't know it was a book. I didn't know what, I didn't think about that. I was writing for myself, but my Aunt Petey, who's Roseanne in this book, she's just unbelievable. She does these incredible sculptures out of wood, <laughs> uh, mahogany, you know, and different things like that. She's 76 years old right now, and she has this bird she's working on in her home right now that's, it must be this long and it's so beautiful and it's just this piece of beauty. And she would, she lives in Maine and she would visit my mom and uh, take photographs of her and then make them into these wild collages of some, you know, my mother with a seagull on her shoulder or something, just fascinating. And she sent me these beautiful things to make me feel closer to my mother as a gift. And I started to say, hey, Aunt Petey, how about you make more of those and let's match them with these poems and let's make something for the family. Mm -hmm. So that was the idea. And then the more I, she, was, she got so tired, she said, like, Judy, I mean, she's a real artist. She lives in Maine. She's like, doesn't want to talk to people. She doesn't want anyone to, she's like, no one can have, it. I'm like, no, no one's going to buy it. No, don't worry. But she was getting very put off by um, my constant, you know, asking her for more art. She says, that's all I have. I can't do anymore. So. I decided to invite in her daughter, who's so immensely talented. She did the cover of the book, and she did so many. She's my age and my, uh, the other two. And they started sending me their artwork, and it, to me it felt like family, hello, family and community. And um, then I realized perhaps it was something bigger that would help other families who were in the same situation. Who, and this is one thing I really have learned. We're all so much the same. Anybody in my situation is like anybody else in the same situation. We really are. And we feel very isolated and alone in this situation. And, you know, I applaud the people who have come to find your group and to find Lisa's Care Connection. I right. work with Lisa's Care Connection at St. Joseph Providence Hospital in different places. I mean, what a wonderful thing to find a community and to understand there's help, that you don't have to be alone, that there's a way to cope. Um, and to see that you're, it's just life and that we're all so very similar. I think that's what I learned. Well, that's, that's huge because <laughs> it, when you are going through it, you do feel like hmm. you're the only one in the world. And I mean, you are in the sense that it's your personal problem with this individual, but right. you're not alone because 5.5 million people <laughs> have Alzheimer's disease. It's yeah, in just our country. In yeah. just our country. Yeah. Right. So it's... So I, we're getting close to the end of the hour. I would like to open it up for questions. Oh, sure. But how about another reading or two before? Do sure. Do you have something in there that Yeah, you I'd love to read... Um, I think I need to read this one just because it has no art with it. <laughs> no. Oh, dear. No, I want to read it just because I think it's... Uh, I think my mom would like this poem. And... Um, she did get the book, by the way. I did get to give the book to my mother while she was here, and that was my goal, and that was, I think, what I really wanted to do. 
Um, but this book, I, I would spend a lot of time when my daughter was a very young reading Dr. Seuss all the time, and over and over and over. So this definitely has a little bit of Seussian quality. It's called In Confidence. I wear a cape as I walk down the street, a lovely large cape that goes down to my feet. I fasten it carefully beneath my chin. The wind is so furious and I am so thin. Ah, uh, well, that's the story I'm willing to tell. The truth is quite different. I'm not little Nell. There's a hole here, you see, the size of a pie plate. Beneath my left shoulder, yes, it seems this is my fate. The wind whistles through me in the key of plain C. I've tried humming and singing and slapping my knee. Nothing will stop this loud hullabaloo. I think if you'd heard it, you'd wear a cape too. The hole can't be filled in no matter the angle. Mud is too heavy and yarn just a tangle. Been empty a while now. I can't say just when. I've kicked out two sparrows, a mouse, and a wren. This hole is my lot, and I'm sure you'll agree the cape offers solace for kazoo playing me. I'm open to any new options you hear of. The quickest of fixes are ones I steer clear of. The truth is, a part of me is out on vacation. To see her again would be cause for elation. I dream that she knows me and utters my name. To achieve this small feat would end this whole game. The hole would fill in. It would be a fine day. I'd hang up my cape, try to dress a new way. But for now, I'll keep whistling and searching the sky for a sign that all's well that there's no need to cry. I'll walk, run, and stumble until I learn why the tune that, I, tune that I'm playing can't fathom goodbye. I think my mom would like that poem. <laughs> so where are you now after your mom, your mom has passed away, you, your book is, is here. Um, where are you, I mean, not, yeah. you know, spiritually, mentally, what, what's oh. happened in the last four months or so? Has there been any changes for you? It's very interesting to lose someone to Alzheimer's disease because you're so used to that wonderful lady you took care of for 12 years. And you, if you really have entered their world, you're very close to that person. And it's very sad when they're gone, you mourn that person first and then all of a sudden, your mother comes back, this woman, this lady, this mother who raised me. And I have dreams all the time now about my mom and who she was and what she looked like. And I remember things that I never dared to think of when she was ill. I don't think I went back and saw her the way she used to be. So it's, it's quite a process to get your head around who you're mourning. There are quite a few different people not, there. Not to be, not to probe you too much, but the things you remember, are you talking about positive things, negative things? Everything. You, everything. That you wouldn't remember while you were carrying Yeah, her? no, I was so involved with who that, who my mom was and who she is now. And I just don't think I, gosh, I wish she were more like that or I didn't go there. That would have been too painful, Yeah. right? Yeah. To be looking for the old mom. Hey, mom, remember me? No. <laughs> That doesn't work. That's no, no, not interesting. I think that the, defines, though, for lack of a better term, the success you had in coping was that you dealt with mm. who was right there in front of you. Right. And not wanting, or well, yes, wanting probably, but not trying to turn her back yeah. into that other person that you knew growing up. Yeah. That you, you, took, you took that person in front of you and accepted that person. Yeah. And with her limitations, and you tried to meet that person instead of that person meet you. Right. And I think it gave her peace, and I, that's the one thing I think I can remember that I did try my best, that I tried to bring her peace and tried to make her life a little better. Well, I really thank you so much for coming and reading the poems and... You know, it's they're joy. beautiful on so many different levels. And I would like to open it up to anyone here today that may have some questions for, for Judy or any thoughts or comments. Um, I've read your book. I love it. And I have a similar story to you. And what I learned from my own experience is my place in my family. I was the uh, youngest of two, uh, the oldest being a, uh, a son.
son. And so through the illness, I realized my place in my family. Did you uh, experience something uh, similar? Absolutely. And I did in a, well, yeah. I realized how important my mother was in that equation. And that, yeah, I was, I, I, I think I was a bit of a black sheep. Or, yeah, female in a terribly patriarchal setup. So, yes, I think I really did learn. Um, and I think my mother wanted me, although she grew up in the same way, in quite a patriarchy, she wanted me to be who I wanted to be. She'd say, Judy, you should direct. Throw that acting thing away. Be a director. You know, so <laughs> that's nice to hear when you're really <laughs> young. <laughs> okay. I can do that, Mom? Boy, it's not what I've heard, but okay. <laughs> it's a really interesting, thank you for that question. Anyone else? Hello. I think we were talking about um, being with your mother, she was, and friends, and you were asking about, um, well, I guess it's sort of a combination of this thought that um, people aren't themselves. from people having told you um, that you go through two childhoods, your initial childhood, then your adulthood, and then you go and become a child again, which is why you need to depend on your family and the family caregiver or uh, other caregivers. And I'm just wondering if, there, if there's um, something you might say about this not being a second childhood and this being um, not a different person, but actually a progression, just like childhood was originally, but completely different. That um, you wouldn't tell your 18 or 30 year old or 40 or 50 year old little child that you miss the infant that they were. Well, I'm sure you know, it's, it's possible to do that from time to time, but you don't want them to go back and become an infant that you have to carry around on, on your hip, you know? and. Um, so when people are old and whatever kind of illness that they have, chronic illnesses are part of old age, um, you might miss the, the adult that didn't have these chronic illnesses, but it's, it's not a second childhood, and I'm, I'm just wondering if they have it. And, and it's not a different person either, um, I don't think. I think it's the same person in a different situation, and I'm just wondering if you might have any comments for sure. It's definitely not a different person. It's just a person who maybe can't walk or a person who can't talk or a person who can't um, move in the same way they did. But it's a very nice point you're making. No, it isn't a second childhood and they have dignity. And that's the most important thing to protect is the dignity of the human spirit, which is, I think, greater than everything. And I saw that to the end in my mother, the same dignity that she always had. And I wanted to protect it. For sure, for sure. I think as a child we're very, um, well, I was taught to behave and to be terribly polite. So <laughs> I think I had to, I needed to take a good look at who she really was and try to understand in order to better understand myself. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Yes. Oh, questions. <laughs> Eager beaver. Go for it. Um, what would be some advice you know, you, um, hmm. that you could leave us with how to deal, well, I don't know, it's, it's so different for everyone's circumstance, but what would be like one, of, one or two things that you could say would work for most people in dealing with a parent in this situation that would be most helpful to help us with the process of being a caregiver? Number one, to make sure they're safe, to make sure they're very safe. If they're in their home and they, are burning the sleeves on their, you know, um, nightgown 
and the stove is full of black things, you know it's time to protect them. So to protect them very well, and at the same time, I guess, let them be who they are going to be and, and let them go. Mm -hmm. That's an excellent question, Ben. Yeah, thank um, you. All the comments have been great. Any, any final thoughts or, or comments? I was going to ask that same question, which was, what's the advice? And thank you for asking that. Um, can I ask you one question? Yes. How, a lot of people have to be faced with the decision of <clears throat> how do I care for this person? And where do I care for them? Do I care for them at home? Do I care for them in, in a, a safe, you know, environment like an assisted living or, or a, a unit or a residential facility for someone with dementia. How, how did you come to the decision that you made about that? Because this is a, such a tough important. spot for caregivers. Well, I think what's really, really important is to understand and to let go. That's one of the big things for me to learn that I didn't do everything better than anyone else in the world. <laughs> so initially, only I can take care of my mother. I can do it perfectly. I know what she needs. I am, she needs me. I need to be here. I wish they would let me bring her to California, but they won't. She's in me. There's this ego thing that happens. And truthfully, somebody else might be able to care better for your parent. Mm -hmm. And somebody else might be able to keep them safer than you can. And it's a very humbling thing to to learn that and that you are not the center of the universe and just because you're the daughter yes you're somebody that they love but their life has moved on a little bit so if other people can react to if my mother is flailing and throwing things and if somebody else can keep a really cool head and be like okay Cece I do this all day long and I do this with a lot of people come on over here and if you're the daughter and you can't talk to me like that that's not gonna work right that's not gonna work and so you need to take yourself out of the equation because that's not healthy for your parent or loved one. Right. So I think that was my understanding is that, no, yeah, she doesn't really know that I'm her daughter and I'm not. It's just it, that whole idea of it's not about me. That's a very, I mean, that's very insightful because I think the ego, the ego thing that you talked about does happen. Oh. We all have our pride about being the best daughter, the best son, the best partner, spouse that we can be in taking care of someone. And people take it very personally if, if it becomes so difficult and it becomes conflict, you know, conflicting and sure. fights. And sure. So and we want to control a situation that's entirely out of control. But that's right? a, so. a great example of letting go. That's it. I think it, I think it made my life better to understand that, it, that I could do that that I didn't need to try to control the whole thing. <laughs> well, Judy, it was just tremendous that you came here and read today and Thank you. on so many different levels and um, Well, I'm so excited and moved by your work. Well, thank you. And um, you and Patty and you're making a big difference to a lot of people. Well, and I'm very excited that that's going on and that the conversation is becoming more and more public and that people are reaching out. Definitely. And, and this was a tremendous way to reach out, I think. And for people that maybe don't go to a group, I, although I recommend it, you know, a lot of people do. That's my bias, because uh, we can help you. But for people who, who are going to a group, who aren't going to a group, uh, it doesn't matter. I think reading something like this and looking at just something very pure, because it is pure. It's not advice. It's not a how-to, it's just pure experience of a journey that people can really relate to different aspects of what's, you know, different things in here. Thank you. And so I think it's a wonderful way to reach out to people and reach a lot of people uh, of different backgrounds and different thinking. And there's something in here for everybody. So thank you for sharing it. I'm sure it was thank you. very tough to, to share something so personal. Yeah, it was. You know, at least I'm, you know, maybe I'm projecting. Living out loud. But, yeah, <laughs> exactly. but it, it's Ooh, not, when did I start know, doing that? Not <laughs> I used to hide behind a character, now I'm living out loud. Oh, yeah. dear. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and thank you, everyone, for coming today. 
just want to let you know that we do have these monthly lectures so everybody is welcome to come they're right now they're here every month and uh, I think Catherine Serrano who's in the back of the room who does a tremendous job of coordinating so many different things including our support group and our our lectures but she's there with information and we have some information back there on studies that we have for people with dementia and some of our services and resources that we have here too so please feel free to take something if, if you like and hopefully hopefully we'll see you again and I have the book oh yes I'm in sorry. case anyone and wants Judy the book does have books here um, if anybody is interested and uh, they're in the back of the room please feel free to thank you to partake okay Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much. Thank you.